everyone, how's it going? Dr. Incompetent here, and I'd like to do a complete beginner's guide on Darkest Dungeon 2, shall we? This is a fantastic game that carries some of the lineage from the first Darkest Dungeon, uh, but changes it to a much more roguelike experience than the first game ever was in uh, some interesting ways, and yet still preserves that rogue light element, the permanent sense of progression that you can gain in the background as they've changed the game for a full release. It's a complicated game, it's a punishing game, it's brutal, just like the first one, but I think that you can enjoy this game even if you never played the first one, for example, or if you like the first one but this one is different, there still is something here. I have found that when I get into this game more, I am enjoying it more than I did in early access, and I think they've made good changes to the game. So in this guide, what I'm going to do here is start up a brand new game of Darkest Dungeon 2 and walk you through the basics of the game. I'm going to explain the UI, the, the controls, some basic tips and tricks, the strategy, so that you can really sink your teeth into this game. I'm not going to tell you the absolute best party composition. I'm not going to min-max um, and take any of that decision-making away from you, but rather I'm just going to walk through my thought process, narrate what I'm doing, and give you the fundamentals so you can enjoy this game at your own pace. Because once you start making traction in Darkest Dungeon 2, it really comes alive. So I've created a brand new account and I'm just going to start a new journey right down here. Oh no. My protege. My friend. Our calculations were correct. The ephemeral equation is unbalanced. The Earth spins on a strange and terrifying new axis. And everywhere, unbridled consequence. The world is a wasteland of failures past. And yet, you must ride out into it. Afraid. Take this. It is hope. The very last of it. It is yours now. You were bold once. Be bold once more. Free yourself from this suffocating stillness. Fix your gaze on the horizon. Face the fearsome truth of the darkest dungeon. It's not good. It's things seem to be going rather badly. But we've got in our command the last hope on our wagon. Let's turn this thing around. Indistinct and ill lighted. No comfort awaits you here. It looks okay. I mean, it looks better than some of the places we might stay. So here we go, and we're going to begin our confession. <laughs> I mean, yes, this is indeed the darkest dungeon. So I'm going to go through this guide kind of talking to you in a way that is either if you played the previous game or you haven't. It doesn't matter. And I'm going to re-explain things for you, make connections between the games, because honestly, it's... I want to say 10 years between the release of the two games, so it's been a while if you played the first one at release. Now, I have a complete Let's Play of Darkest Dungeon, the original, on the channel, and it took me forever to beat that game. It was a long, long effort to get strong enough and to clear that Darkest Dungeon, and it looks like our work is not done, so we need to pick it up here 
And let's sign our confession by beginning with the prologue. And let's sign our signature there. All right. So here we are with the stagecoach. Now, I'm going to explain some of what you see. This light right here is our beacon of hope. And when you mouse over it, it gives you a number of how strong the intensity of the light is. And you want to keep that full. That baby goes out. It's over. Bright light, 100. And you can see that very similar to the first game, there is a torchlight mechanic. The brighter the light, your heroes gain benefit, but there's less reward. The dimmer the light, things are more dangerous, but you have the potential to get more reward. So you kind of balance that risk reward. Now, I myself am a very cautious player, so I like to keep this baby as bright as possible because look how terrifying things are and the game in my opinion is already hard enough so i try to make it as easy as i can and maybe i earn less progress at a slower rate you know it's like my progress is a little slower but you make progress you don't you don't die but your appetite for risk might be different and you might want to you know change things up that's just my approach now in the upper right of the game anytime you get something new it's very helpful it bakes in these tutorial pop-ups where you can click on this and get the information about the stagecoach and it says here the stagecoach is your carriage coffin and confessional the three c's really that i look for in any vehicle that i want to drive so you move this thing around using w a s and d and you're going to drive it okay so you you hold w to move it forward and you kind of just move around now it has a bit of a drift to it because you know it's a horse-drawn carriage so you'll get used to the momentum of it then there's also stagecoach view which you can push z to bring up and it shows you what items you currently have equipped on your stagecoach at the beginning of the game you're not going to have anything it's going to take you a while to actually start outfitting your stagecoach with enhancements but it's a really cool feature of it which that you get to kind of upgrade this mobile base that you have but importantly and this is something that at least when i was playing in early access was not there you have armor and wheel points so there are shields and wheels that you'll see on your stagecoach and if you go over some rough terrain um, you will lose a wheel point and if you get smashed by something uh, you will lose an armor point and if you lose any of those uh, completely then you're going to have some drastic encounter happen where you're trying to repair the stagecoach so you can keep moving so you want to keep both your wheels and your armor as high as possible sometimes that happens by surprise like you know just there's something in the road that you you couldn't have predicted and it's unlucky but it becomes part of the decision making process you're going to plan your route and as you're calculating which route do I want to take my stagecoach along, you might see, well, there's going to be some pitfalls in the road. It's rough road up here. I want to avoid that. Or, no, you know what? I have plenty of wheel points. I can do that. Um, and you just make your calculations accordingly. Now, you can repair them with the Wainwright at the inn, which is kind of like a resting point between different stages of the journey, which we'll see. Whenever you're done with this awesome archive of all the little bits in the game just click up here in the upper right and close this window now right here because we're in the prologue no time is passing we're good to go and i'm just going to hold w and start moving this stagecoach so in the first darkest dungeon you had your hamlet i know failure well i glimpsed it lurking at the ragged edges of your mind ouch I watched its venom spread through the veins of the world and I trembled at its terrible reverberations. Fair enough. The crossroads. Wait for the lantern's light and welcome what help may come. So we get some great decisions here. Do we want to go towards guilt, loathing, failure, regret, disgrace? These are just amazing options. So as I was saying, in the first game, you had your Hamlet, which is what you built up to give your, your account a permanent sense of progress. Remember... This is a rogue light, L-I-T-E game, meaning that if we die um, and we wipe, we have to start over and do a new run, but we don't lose everything like you would in a rogue like L-I-K-E. In that sense, you just lose everything and you have to start from scratch. In this one, by gaining candles of hope, we can boost our account and make ourselves incrementally stronger even through failure. So it's 
brutal, but there is some hope, and that's what we're going to cling to. Now, in the first game, you had your Hamlet, and in this one, you have your stagecoach, your characters themselves, and you've got the candles of hope and the upgrades you can do with them, as we'll see later. I'm going to click on this, and let's go. Okay, so again, here comes the archive telling us uh, that we have the party. Four heroes will join together on this expedition. Your salvation rides with them. And in party creation, you can drag or double-click the hero portraits to assemble your party of heroes. The hero in the rightmost position of your roster will be first in the combat line. And I cannot emphasize that enough. You know, um, I'm used to reading left to right, but in this sense, it's true Darkest Dungeon format. These portraits, and I'm going to close the archive here, on the bottom center of the heads-up display or HUD, these golden diamonds these represent the party order and the right side is the front and the far left side is the back so when you begin the game many of the characters are locked and you unlock them at the altar of hope by using the candles which are the permanent progression currency that i was talking about we don't have any right now so you need to start with this party fortunately for us this party is actually pretty sweet now this, uh, if you played the first game, you will recognize all of these classes. So this is Barristan. He's a man at arms, and you can always just change his name, and it, it, you know you can give him a random name, or you can give them a completely unique name of your own choosing. I'm going to give him his own name. Now below this, it says Wanderer, and we get one candle if we reach the second inn with him as a wanderer. This is a new feature to Darkest Dungeon 2 from the first game, where not only do you have characters that have a class, like he's a man-at-arms, but you can specialize them with a kind of a path, and wanderer is the only path that we have right now. And this helps you gain candles, which we want anyway, so this is fine. And now the information displayed is this you'll see that there are it says rank and then there are these four spheres right here and they're glowing with different levels of intensity and what these mean is barristan does best in the first second or third position and he's okay at the back but less strong there he's kind of a tank and his abilities do better and can target more things if he's in the front also, you'll see on the right side where it says target, you can see that he's best at targeting foes in the first and second ranks, a little okay at the third and not so good at the fourth rank. So he doesn't have good range, but that's okay. It also tells you right here, he's a resolute defender tempered by the merciless blows of innumerable assaults, which means he wants to be in the front, he guards, he's durable, and he has repost. You can also go ahead and look at his skills by clicking the second tab from the top on the right portion of the character select screen. And this shows you what abilities he has. Now, at any given time, your character is going to have, uh, I believe, five abilities selected. Now, at the beginning, it doesn't matter because I haven't unlocked any of these other ones. So there's really no choosing. But later, you get to make all kinds of awesome customization choices with your loadout, where you choose what skills you want, you choose what path you want, and that's all unlocked with candles as you go. So then you can look down at his quirks. Now these are random, totally um, individualized based when you're rolling heroes. So he has a stress killer, which is his good perk, which means um, the knitting needles fly when stress is high. So he does good, I guess, when stress is high. And then he's greedy, which means he's always focused on his share. So. We have to watch him. He's going to be a greedy one. Then there's his different paths, which we were just talking about a moment ago. We only have Wanderer. And you can read um, his story as you visit Shrines of Reflection. Now, Shrines of Reflection are locations you can visit on the map when you're doing a run in the game. And what these allow you to do is choose one of your heroes and unlock their backstory, which gives you access to more skills, potentially more paths, and more features of that hero. So you get to choose who you want to unlock and fully develop first. So 
Right now, again, not many choices, but you can see how much depth and cool, rich decision making is embedded in this game and why I'm liking it more and more as I go. Now, I'm going to just double click. Pride. More devastating than the horrors of a hundred campaigns. You know, I haven't seen a hundred campaigns, so I can't verify that little piece of wisdom there. But I'm going to put our eye patched man at arms in the front. And I'm actually going to go with the exact order that they recommend. We'll put Dismas, who is our highwayman, second. We're going to put Audrey, our grave robber, third. And we're going to put Paracelsus, our plague doctor. We'll put her fourth. Now, you can do whatever you want. I like this order of just going with what we've got here. And Dismas, you can see he's an amazing DPS character and he has some wily tactics up in the front that will unfold. But you, you see right here, he doesn't do great in the first position, so you, you'd rather have him in the second slot. I mean, he is a fugitive, that's fine. And here we go, we've got Audrey. Now, she has great ranged attacks. Uh, and we're going to just put her in the third position. Slips unseen into the catacombs of the mind. I, you took that to a place I didn't expect there, but that's fine. And then Paracelsus is our kind of debuffer, also healer. Uh, just a very, very good support character. And don't sleep on the Plague Doctor's ability to use Blight as a powerful damage over time. So I'm going to put Paracelsus, I'm going to put her way in the back. The hands. So this lineup is called the Usual Suspects. If you, there are certain party configurations that the game has pre-made names for, and, you know, it's a good indication that it's probably pretty powerful, and that's what they give you to start, so we're going to go with it. And again, you're f free to kind of like investigate everybody's skills, but I'm going to start talking about these skills in the context of battle so that they make more sense. But on your own, you can just look at all of the other information, and I'm going to just go right here and start it up. Alright, here we are in the valley. Onward. And let us hope enough yet remains of the world. Okay, so now it's telling us about the roster arrangement, and we can rearrange this at any time while driving to drag the, the, the order around, and this is absolutely vital at times. The party order determines what position each hero is in when the battle starts. The furthest hero to the right begins at the front. And there are times when you might get jostled around at, in combat, and you want to make sure you have your people in the right position as you go. Now, before I start moving, there's no time right now. You can just chill. This this thing ain't going down, um, you know, right now until we start moving. Up in the upper left, you'll see I've got two wheels and I've got two armor. Wheels are damaged when we're on rough routes. And um, when the wheels are at 100% strength, each hero gets 50% travel healing. This is a huge point in the game. You heal as you're traveling. So, you know, this was not something at all that was in the first game. Healing is done much differently in this one um, through items and through just moving. So having full wheels is amazing for healing up. And here's our armor, and this is affected if we're on hazardous routes. And if you are at 100%, each hero starts the round with the defend status symbol, and we'll take a look at what all of those mean in a moment. Now you're going to see some more stuff on the bottom center of the heads up display. You're going to see our characters from uh, right to left and the red bar is their health. Everybody starts at full health and the bottom bar is their stress. And it used, stress used to be out of 100. It's just out of 10 in this. Each pip corresponds to 1 out of 10. And then in the lower left, you're going to see that there's the map. If I click on this, uh, you can bring this up at any time by just pushing M or clicking on the map in the lower left. You can see here's where we are on the map. We are the stagecoach here, and we're going to be moving forward. We're going to get into a fight at a barricade. There's going to be an assistance encounter where we meet some uh, kind of 
down on their luck individuals that we can give help to on the side of the road and then we're going to get to the old bridge now right now you can see we only have one option to move but as we get further beyond the kind of like prologue tutorial of the game these pathing choices will resemble something like slay the spire where you have choices where i could go right i could go left and you look at the layout of the map and you make your decisions based on you know are there rough routes or hazardous routes are there enemies are are there locations i want to go to what am i trying to do and you drive your stagecoach along the path that seems the best for you right now we have no choice so that's fine and then right here you can click to see goals and conditions we don't have any hero goals right now because we're just starting out but once you get further in the game, each of your heroes will get like a sub goal for the mission. And if you complete it, you get a small little reward uh, that's kind of like a daily quest or whatever. It's just a small achievement that you can get. And it gives you candles usually, which is great. And then over here, uh, you can push I to open up your inventory, which shows you what you have. Or you can click this little bag on the bottom right of your HUD. It sorts it by default by just all items. So we have 40 relics, which is kind of like one form of currency. And you can see at the bottom of this panel, the three different kinds of currency that we can spend. There's relics, mastery points, which are for leveling up our skills. And there are baubles, which we can buy other types of items with like upgrades for the stagecoach, trinkets and things like that. Um, then you can sort by combat items, items that you use at the inn, trinkets that you equip on your heroes and then items that you affix to your stagecoach then you can push z to actually look at your stagecoach itself and you can see you can give it another name right now it's just called the last hope there's all sorts of different slots where you can affix things uh, for the flame for the item slot for the trophy slot you unlock more as you go and i'm just going to close these up and you can hold alt to kind of highlight everything on the screen and you can push actually rather it's a toggle so you hold control to bring up this screen so the icon i call defend is just what i call it but it's actually called block in the game you're going to be doing this a ton holding control to bring up this status screen because this screen explains every single buff debuff in the game um, for the most part and it's incredibly useful until you learn these things and look how great this game is when you mouse over it it tells you straight up so if you have this block buff on yourself you just take 50 percent damage when you get hit so this is a because our armor is at full everybody's going to be taking 50 percent less damage from that first hit so it's sensational and you can take a look at these later we'll look at these more within the context of an actual battle uh, but i also want to say you can uh, right click on your hero portrait to bring up their hero screen and this shows you all of your different skills that you have equipped it shows you their resistances it shows you their quirks what trinkets they have equipped it tells you what their initiative speed is how what their stress level is at um, what their health is at and then you can click through and you can see what their relationships are at and these start pretty neutral, 9 out of 20, and they can go into the blue, which is bad, or into the gold, which is amazing. And I don't want to sleep on this. Relationships are incredibly important. If you have good relations with the rest of your crew, all sorts of awesome synergistic moments can happen where you do things and people trigger and combo with each other, and it just like your life gets really easy. If the relationships get really sour, your life becomes a nightmare. This used to be harder to manage, in my opinion, in the early access. I think they've tempered it a bit, which is good, because it would be so brutal if people wouldn't agree. Try to keep your relationships high. We've already looked at the combat skills, and you can look here at conditions to just get a sense of like what's going on with my person if there's something going on. Now, additionally, Notice right down here, there's more icons that are not on this control screen. So using the combination of the icons on the control screen and then these resistance icons here, you can know what every icon in the game does. So you just consult either one. Like if you see this green swirly and you're like, what's this? Oh, it's blight. 
or you know what's the, what do these four diamonds mean that are gold oh that means stun but if the four diamonds are blue that also means um stun but negative like i'm going to lose my next action this is my actual resistance to being stunned so you kind of have to consult both of those sheets to get what you want and then pets we don't have any pets yet but boy do we want some all right let's go i'm going to move forward now i'm going to actually hold s to stop this is important you can stop at any time just like in the original darkest dungeon you can just stop it's not real time I know you see the leaves blowing, but just you can chill and just survey what you're doing before you move forward. You see this pile of leaves on the upper right along the road. These babies, you want to smash into as many of these things as you can because there can be hidden goodies inside. So it's kind of a fun little game that you're going to play with your wagon, which is try to hit the leaf pile. So I'm going to kind of get my horse to the edge here and try to hit these. I'm going to go in the middle, hit this one, and then boom. We just hit the barricade. Now that barricade's unavoidable. It was the fight that we saw on the map. Barricades will be across the road, will stop your stagecoach, and you get into a fight. And here we are in combat. Now this is going to be very similar to what you might be familiar with if you played the original Darkest Dungeon. But if it's been a while or you didn't, let's talk about this. This is a turn-based combat so like when you're driving the stagecoach that's kind of you know real time as long as it's moving this is totally turn-based take your time we're going to go in order of the initiative and right now dismas gets to act first which is this you see this kind of gold icon below him that's glowing up that indicates it's his turn in the upper right you can see next paracelsus will act and if i mouse over this it will highlight Paracelsus so you can see her down there then Audrey gets to go then Barristan goes okay uh, so we are going in this order wait 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 this might be right to left let's see which way this goes I swear <laughs> I always read left to right so I'm like wait a minute are we talking right to left let's find this out let's click on combat to get more information Combat is turn-based and proceeds until one side is defeated. Once in battle, there is no retreat. So, you, know, you could run, presumably, in the first Darkest Dungeon. Maybe. I hardly ever did that unless it was dire straits. But you can't run in this. Let's go to turn order. Each hero or enemy rolls initiative at the beginning of each turn. And this is modified by the speed. The speed is that purple clock icon we, look like on the character, uh, we looked at. On the character screen, the turn order is shown by the portraits in the top right. Um, only a partial turn order is shown. You can plan ahead a little, but not completely right. So they don't show everything. You know how like some games that turn order runs all the way across the top of the HUD, and you can see for like 50 turns who's going to go when. That's not this game. There's still some mystery, and there's a role. It's not strictly based on what value your speed is. There is a role. You The higher the... You know, the greater your chance of going first, but not a guarantee. Actions. So on your turn, you may first use a combat item if you have one equipped and it's a free action. I still am having to get used to this. If you have a combat item, which we don't have any, but if you have some, you could use them for free. So they're really, really powerful in the sense that it doesn't take your turn to use them. Then you can use your skill normally. Either way, a left click on the item and the skill is displayed on the hotbar, so you can click it with left click, or you can use the number keys 1 through 7. Your skills can only be used if your hero is in the correct launch rank, which means the correct position in your party, and then it can only be used against an enemy that's in the appropriate target rank that your skill is going to be targeting. To see what ranks a, uh, a skill can target, look at the tooltip of the skill. The circular pips tell you this information. A solid pip means it's valid. An empty pip means it's not. Some skills can target multiple enemies, which is shown by pips joined together. And it, they'll have a line connecting them. We'll see that in a moment with either Paracelsus or our Grave Robber Audrey. Those are AoE skills. In addition to doing damage, skills can cause a variety of effects. Most of these are shown by tokens. So those icons I keep explaining to you, the game is calling those tokens. 
and you can mouse over any of those to get more information or use the status screens that I was showing you. And then there is a glossary as we looked at by holding control to get more info. So let's break this down. Dismas, our high woman, it's his turn. You can see right here it says Dismas, he's highlighted. Here's his skills in the middle. I can do any of these skills right here. Additionally, I can move instead of attacking if I got out of position or if I want to change the party order for some reason. You can also pass your turn if you don't want to do anything, and this can come up in your strategy, like if you're trying to get off a heal or you want somebody else to do their thing uh, or whatever your reasoning, but there's a consequence. If you pass, you gain two stress, which is not an insignificant amount. All right, so let's look at what Dismiss can do. So if I mouse over Wicked Slice, which is my first skill right here, and this does correspond to number one, so this does go left to right. Um, I can use his dagger. You see right here, you know, in his right hand, he's got a dagger. In his left hand, he has a pistol. It's a melee attack. Dismiss can do this if he's in the first, second, or third position, which he is, and he can target the first or second position of the enemy. He can't hit the third and fourth. Those pips are empty. Or, if I wanted, I could shoot my gun. Dismiss can shoot his gun from any party position except the first because, you know, it's a, it's a ranged weapon, and he can hit anyone that on the enemy's side that's not in the first position. I also have the option to do Duelist Advance. Now, for Duelist Advance, I want you to kind of look over to the left under Dismiss. For all of these skills, it's going to tell you what the range of damage is, what the crit percentage is, and what other effects happen when I do this ability. So, for example, Duelist Advance says self repost times two, and it moves you forward in the party one. Now, remember, repost, I can just hold control, and you can see right here what this does. Repost means I counterattack any damaging attack that's coming at me. So if somebody tr is trying to do damage to me, um, I might still get hit by it, but I'm going to counterattack it um, two times. I get two stacks of the token repost. Then there's tracking shot, which ignores if they have dodge or stealth, and uh, it puts combo on the target, and then also removes stealth or dodge, which is very, very good if somebody's being super evasive. And then I've got take aim, which it gives me these things on self, and it removes blind. So if I've been blinded, I can remove it with take aim, and I also give myself crit, which means my next skill has 100% crit, and it ignores 20% of resistance, which is, you know, insane. And then um, I also give myself dodge, which gives me a 50% chance to dodge the next attack. So what do I want to do? Well, I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, I love Duelist Advance with Dismiss. So when he... I'll select it. I'm going to left-click on this. And now you'll see on the enemies, there are blue bars beneath them, which meaning like which one do you want to hit? Do you want to hit this guy or do you want to hit this guy? Now when I mouse over them, look at the bottom center of the screen. It tells you I have a 100% chance to hit. It's going to do 3 to 5 damage. I have a 5% chance to crit. So you really want to calculate what's my chance to hit, what's my range of damage, and how much do I crit? And then on the right, in the bottom right of the HUD, you'll see this is a lost soul. He's gone, and he has 13 health. You can see all of his resists as well. So this is not going to kill the guy, but I want to start wearing him down. So I'm going to do this. Now watch what happens with Dismiss when I select this. I'm going to left click. Now Dismiss moves forward. When Dismiss moves forward, because Duelist Advance advances him one square or one position forward, he displaces Barristan, who was there, and they just swap places. Generally, whenever you move, you're just going to swap positions with whoever is in that square and just kind of reorder the party accordingly. Now let's look at Barristan's abilities. So Barristan has Crush, which is like I hit people with my mace. But if that target has combo, that kind of uh, skull that's like, glowing blue flames means combo, then he just heals 10%. So 
you can do very nicely with this if Barristan's been taking damage. You can apply combo, like with take aim, for example, and then have Barristan hit and heal up, do some damage. Barristan also has Rampart, which will move him forward, and then he'll go, the party will be back in the original position, and he will do damage, and he will knock back who whichever target he hits or has a chance to knock them back. Uh, enemies have a resistance to movement altering effects, and then we also have a chance to stun them. That blue swirly, oh, that's uh, alt, just focusing on him. Um, the blue swirly with control, you can see, is daze. So next turn will be delayed until the end of the round. I'm sorry, I always confuse this for stun. It's a crowd control, but it's not the same as stun. Stun is even worse. They just lose their action. Daze is like you have first strike on them, uh, or at least that's how it operated in Darkest Dungeon 1. They get to go, but they go last. So the idea is like you daze them, and then you try to kill them before they get to act, and you effectively negate their action, which you would do anyway if you kill them, but if you push them to the end of the turn order, you have a much higher chance of being able to kill them before they get to act. I can also defend, which allows me to select one of my own party members and defend them, and it will put two stacks of uh, guarded on them, which means like Barristan will step in the way and take the damage twice for that unit and put two stacks of block on Barristan, which means he'll take 50% less damage. So very good for, you know, kind of tanking or taunting. And I've got Bolster. Bolster is amazing because what this bad boy lets you do is reduce stress. So um, if Barristan has five or more stress, he will reduce stress by one and gain guard. And then if the target you use this on has five or more stress, then they lose a stress and they also remove uh, the vulnerable token if they have this on them. This debuff is nasty, so it's great. And then we've got Hold the Line, which uh, is really, really good because it, if for whatever reason Barristan has been moved way back to the back of the party, this lets him move forward three. So he like gets to jump way in the back, uh, from the back up to the front and do his job defending everyone. He puts defense on himself and um, he becomes immobilized, which means he can't be pushed back again. So very good. Now for me, what I like to do is I love Rampart. I'm always huge on this ability because I like dazing. I like knocking them back. And uh, if I put it on this, I have a 100% chance to hit and I can use this. And I also want to be in the front even though Dismas has this awesome repost, I still want Dismas to be in the second position so that uh, we can do Duelist Advance again and, uh, you know, we can allow him to survive a little bit longer. He'll still get targeted in the second spot, but I'm a big fan of this ability. Let's see how it goes. And oh, or that happened. Let us hope to finish this quickly. Okay, so a lot of things just happened there. Let's talk through it. I just did my ability, but Barristan decided to crit, so we just insta-killed that enemy. I'm going to look at crits. When a crit is struck, it does several things. Normal attacks do 150% damage, and then if it's an ability that is doing damage over time, like Bleed, Blight, or Burn, it's duration 2 plus rounds. It ignores 20% of resistance, um, and heals do 150% more healing. So that's all amazing. Now, you'll notice that it was a death blow. There are several times when I have to pause and just tell you this is really important because this is a big change from the first game. In the first game, your characters would go on death's door and they wouldn't be killed instantly when taken um, to zero or below health the first time, kind of like Dungeons & Dragons, and you had a chance to like stabilize them. The enemies never got that ability, but in this game they have it. So sometimes you will do lethal damage to an enemy, but they will go on death's door but not die. And it's the most frustrating thing about the game, in my opinion. It's so brutal. So if you can kill something um, right away, like you just hit them and then they go to death blow 
then you don't have to worry and you're fine. But they can survive that, so you really, really have to pay attention to that. But luckily, we got it. And because we pushed this guy back, he's in the second position here, and he's gone. He's not blocking us. So now it's time for us to go. Now, it's confirmed, by the way, from my own incompetence. Let's verify. This is moving right to left. So the round order is going right to left. All right. So what do we want to do with Audrey? Audrey has uh, some melee attacks, which she's a actually able to do from the third position, which is so awesome. And then she has uh, some good ranged attacks as well as a little bit of self-care. So pick to the face is fantastic if the enemy is really defensive. It ignores the defense token or the block token if they have it. If they're comboed, you do you have 50% more crit chance, so it's really, really good. And you can only use it on targets in the first or second spot. Thrown Dagger is a ranged attack. It ignores um, if an enemy is being guarded by someone else. And if she is stealthed, it ignores dodge on the enemy target, and it has a boost if they're comboed. Flashing daggers, notice that in it, it hits both position 2 and 3. You'll see that the blue pips under the words flashing daggers in the middle center of the bottom portion of the screen are connected. It's an AoE attack. It's awesome. Then there's poison dart which ap applies two stacks of Blight, which is a damage over time. And then we've got her Absinthe, which she can chug if she's hurt. And if she's below 25% health, she heals 33% and puts on three stacks of Dodge and gives herself um, haste, basically, uh, which is she just acts faster next round. She gets the speed buff. So very good if you can trigger that. All right. But... Of all of the abilities that we have, I love Poison Dart, but look, if you could see that these enemies actually have really strong Blight Resistance. They have 40 Blight Resistance. That's a lot. So it's not going to be very effective. Plus, that's for a longer fight. This fight's going to be over pretty soon. So let's act faster, and I'm just going to go ahead and pick to the face. Bam, six damage. All right, and by the way, another tip. You'll see the enemies. There's their health bar. If there is this gold bar below the health bar, that means that enemy has not yet acted in the round and still gets to go. So even if you can't see the full round order, you can still kind of see like which enemies get to go so that you don't focus fire some enemy that's already acted and instead use your energy trying to kill something that hasn't gone. Now, Paracelsus is great at hitting the back ranks but there's nothing there so you see that Paracelsus' second third and fourth abilities all can't be used now battlefield medicine can't be used just because nobody's hurt enough to heal in this game unlike the first game you cannot heal unless people are at certain health thresholds and most of the heals have a cooldown so healing is very different than the first game and you need to kind of start changing your mental paradigm of how healing operates in this if you're used to the first one. Um, ounce of Prevention is great for giving us a boost, but let's just go ahead and do Noxious Blast. It's the only thing I can even do that targets the first position with damage. So we're going to try to throw this and put some Blight over here. They did not... They resisted the Blight, but they took the damage initially. Okay. And what did they do? They attacked Barristan, who got stressed out about it for an odd reason, but he took half damage. And now it's back to Audrey. Remember, he took half damage because he had the block token from our full armor on our stagecoach. These tokens do not expire unless the triggering event occurs. So they are there forever and the block will just sit here until someone attacks and it goes off repost will sit here until someone attacks or it goes off now other debuffs have um, will operate in, in different fashions but these are all sitting there so you don't lose it it's very strong 
I'm just going ahead and pick to the face, and we kill and got the death blow, so it's One over. In our path. Indeed. One less obstacle. So what do we get? We get a candle of hope. This is Alter Currency, and this is the permanent progression that we're looking for. These are great to get, and we also got a, a Vague Trinket, a Minor Heart Seeker. So this gives you 3% more crit chance at the expense of 10% healing received from skills. So very similar to what you might be used to in the first Darkest Dungeon. This is a brutal game. As the game says when you boot it up, it's about making the best of a bad situation. Very often, there are pros and cons to the loot. Sometimes it's just all upside, but often the loot has a little bit of a downside. Now this is probably fine. Like 3% crit is reasonable for that trade because we're not going to need to be healing so much at this point, maybe. Uh, but it's up to you if you want to use this. Now I'm going to take all the items. We're going to hop back in our stagecoach. Are you shaken? There is so much worse in store. Thank you. That's very encouraging. Now notice how in the bottom of the HUD you'll see all of our characters have this little exclamation point red badge uh, by their portraits. And that means there is something in our inventory that they can equip. So right here it says inventory. Your stagecoach is limited to how many items it can carry. Press I to view what you can have. And this was something in the first game. It's like inventory Tetris where you can only carry a little bit. Uh, it's managed somewhat by the fact that everything generally takes up just one square, but it stacks to different sizes. Inventory stacking. Your shared inventory is split between all item types. Some stack well where others take an entire slot. You can filter them as we looked at before. Uh, here's the treasures tab. Trinkets, combat items, in items, and stagecoach items will all help you in your quest. You'll find relics, baubles, and mastery tokens which can be used to purchase supplies from vendors or upgrade your hero's skills and then trinkets we can equip in the lower right of our hero right here you can only have two at a time they can be removed or swapped when outside of combat like right now and we can equip trinkets by opening the inventory and selecting the trinket filter and then dragging it to an empty hero slot or double left click on the trinket when we have that screen open so for example um, who do I want to crit not get healed probably dismiss so i'm going to right click on dismiss for now and then i'm going to push i to open up my inventory you can see how both of these panels the character screen and the inventory can fit on the screen at the same time and now you'll see that right here these trinket slots both have the red badge meaning like hey you have something you can put here if you want and i'm just going to double click on this and give it to dismiss and see how he does with a little bit of boost to crit okay and Oh, we can go forward, but let's just push M to show the map, see where we are. We just got through this battle, and we're heading up to the assistance encounter. Okay, and let's keep going. You can see our um, light is going down as we make progress. And here's the desperate few huddled by their little wagon here. And now we're in an encounter. During encounters, you must pick one of the choices by holding the left mouse button on one of your heroes. By the way, you got to hold it. You can't just click it. And the results will be previewed at the bottom of the screen. Affinity changes. Heroes often have different opinions about how a given encounter should be resolved. When you choose a hero's response, any heroes that agree will um, have their mutual affinity increased. Gold glow. So what this means is when you make choices here, your relationships between party members are being affected. If they have the gold glow, they're like, I like that choice and our bond the person making the choice and the person or persons glowing will increase. If it's blue, that means they don't like it. And the relationship will decrease. Assistance encounters bring the heroes face to face with the downtrodden local populace. These forlorn creatures are in need of help and often have valuable supplies to offer to the heroes in return. And if you help them, it's the best way to restore the flame, which is right here. We can see it's our our hope it's at 76 so you'll see it right at the top of the screen and right now here's them and we can only choose between either barristan or dismiss and they both like it so either way these two are going to get along with the decision now it says right here barristan says let us unite them beneath our banner and dismiss says from highwayman to passenger pay is likely worse 
And here's what you need to pay attention to, which is on the bottom of the screen. It's basically saying, um, if we do this, you can hold Alt right here, as it says, to get more information on these icons. If we take Barristan's choice, we're going to get supplies and 100 flame. If we take Dismiss's choice, we get a trinket and 100 flame. I actually want supplies, so I'm going to select Barristan. And you'll notice how... Now, what? here's what happened. Dismiss's relationship toward Barristan went up, but it didn't look like Barristan's relationship toward Dismiss went up reciprocally. It was just his relationship that went up. So if you have one that you're looking to carry or one relationship you want to improve, make sure to have the person whose relationship you want to go up not make the choice. Now, what do we get? We got a Candle of Hope. We got a 100 plus flame. And we get four laudanum. Actually, we get eight laudanum. So we'll take it all. And 100 is the max that our torch can be. So we're back to 100% right there. I'm actually going to push I. And I'm going to right-click Paracelsus. And see, we got this laudanum, which is a combat item. And it removes one stress. And it also removes horror, which adds stress at the end of each round. So if anybody gets the horror token on them, which is a stress over time we can use this now all heroes can equip one combat item and it goes in the upper left of your skills and all you need to do is double click or just drag it over so i'm going to give it to paracelsus and i'm actually also going to give it to audrey so i'm just going to click this to switch over to audrey i'll drag it over here and there we go so now we've got everything equipped uh, combat items and we this explains how to equip them but they're free actions, and you use them before you use your skill. Of course, because once you use your skill, the turn is just over for you. So anytime before you do that, you can use the item. All right, and we're going to keep going. And I'm going to try to hit this leaf pile over here. Bam, I got it. And I'm going to go over here and smack that. Bam. And let's just ride out of control. Oh, no, I'm going to miss this one. No, I just got it. What do you mean a change in the air? So we've reached a bridge on the map, and we're about to get to the inn. It says here, heroes. The hero sheet holds critical information. Open it with C or right-click on the portrait. We did this. And we've looked at this. We've pretty much seen all of this. I don't think I need to read it to you because we talked about it. Um, this is relationships. These are quirks. Negative quirks can be treated at the field hospital, which are locations on the map. And positive quirks can be reinforced at the hospital as well. Here's our combat skills. Um, we can equip five, and the sixth is for combat items. Now, you can toggle these on and off anytime you're not in combat. Oh, it tells you right here. And right now, we only have five, and we need to visit the Shrines of Reflections to unlock more. And here's our hero conditions um, from buffs or in-item use in the upper right that you can see. And I'm just going to keep going forward and push M to close the map. And I'm just going to use the scroll to kind of move around and hit this. Looks like a barricade. we got another fight right here. Even your valley is not immune to the spreading stain. Okay. So, they got... This guy got blinded by our flame, which is great. It's so bright. It has a 10% chance per round to blind enemies. Blind means they have a 50% chance to miss, which is phenomenal. And, because our wagon and stagecoach are doing so well, we all have defend. Now, this big boy right here has 42 insane hit points and has a huge axe. So, we want to try to get rid of this individual, if at all possible. So, I'm going to go ahead and put a poison dart on this dude. He has bad blight resist, so we're going to put blight on him. I'm going to noxious blast this dude. Now, no notice right now, he has two Blight for three turns. These tokens do wear off over time, unlike these buffs right here that only wear off when they're triggered. Now, I'm going to throw the Noxious Blast here. We do three damage, and now, yep, look at that. We've got it on there, and there's a tooltip for dots. Some attacks inflict a dot damage, and Bleed, Blight, and Burn are all dots. Dots cause damage at the beginning of the combatant's turn, until they expire. Many combat items or skills can cure them. Now, they also stack. 
So Audrey put on two, Paracelsus put on four. So that means right before this guy's about to act, he's going to take six damage from Blight. So this is phenomenal. I'm going to duelist advance this dude. Just do some damage to him. Get the repost going. He's acting and he's carving the toy. He actually hit Barristan, which is surprising. And he put a bleed on him. And here we go. They're attacking Barristan. Finally, bam. There we go. Agony by accumulation. So you could see everything that happened right there. Um, all of our defenses got used. Barristan reposted and counterattacked. Put a combo right here. And combat uh, the combo token are special compared to other tokens. Many hero and monster skills have effects that only happen if the target has the combat token on them. In all cases, combo is bad for its recipient. Having it means that the actor is vulnerable to some damage and disruptive skills. They're best used as one-two punches. Use one hero to place it and then another hero to take advantage of it because they will disappear. So I can, if I want, just crush this guy. And then what will happen is you could see as I mouse over with crush selected, Barristan has plus four written on his health bar below his character there, meaning he's going to heal for four health uh, by doing a crush right here. So it's phenomenal. But I'm actually not going to use it. I want to bring this guy forward a bit. So what I'm going to do is um, knock this guy back so that the woodsman moves forward. Academic view. During combat, hold down alt. Uh, while mousing over a hero or an enemy to see the academic view, which zooms in and gives you more information. So this is super helpful. Like, if I mouse over this guy and I hold Alt, it zooms in, and you can just read everything really cleanly right here. It also tells you what skills this enemy has, Filthy, Morsel, and Chomp. So you can plan better if you want to take this target down faster than the others, for example. All right. Now, what do I want to do right here? Well, guess what? I'm spreading out my damage, which I'm not fond of, but I still want to take this guy down. So I'm going to poison dart this guy. And we put more blight on, and now he's taking eight for three turns. And he won't survive that with his current hit points. I am going to... What do I want to do here? I'm still going to duelist advance on this guy. i just focusing him as hard as I can. And then from this spot, we have piercing. Um, we have a more chance to get the blight because, uh, well, the combo is gone. Never mind. I'm still going to do this right there. Let's see what we get. All right. So this guy, there we go. The woodsman is almost dead he's going to die on his action if I have Barristan do his thing which I'm going to do well yeah I was maybe going to kill this but no 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 you could see the woodsman is acting next so let me go ahead and do that now the woodsman has been dazed so he's actually not going to act now look at that he did not die. He used his garlic. Very annoying. And let's read the screen right here. Some monsters have death blow resistance just like heroes do. It's not all. Okay. So, actually, that's good for me. I thought it was everything. So, not everything does. When a monster is on death's door, each further blow has a chance to slay it. Some skills can increase the chance of executing. Repeated blows while it's on death's door will also reduce its death blow resistance. So, he's not long for this world, is what we're saying here. I'm going to go ahead and finish this guy off, and death blow. Another impediment. Cleared with impunity. Now check this out. If I, um, you could see that he has no death blow resistance, this lost soul, so it's a, it's a kill every time. And the affinity system is triggering, which says, to survive your expedition, you'll need to pay attention to how your heroes, this is relationships. A harmonious team is an effective team, but if they're fighting like this demonstrates, then all sorts of bad things can happen. They can block each other from acting or healing. It's so bad. 
each your uh, pair has an affinity value which describes how friendly or unfriendly they feel towards one another. This directly determines the chances of that pair forming a relationship at the next inn. To a few affinities, open any hero's character sheet and look at their relationships tab. And this says that affinities come from a variety of sources, like we just saw the event or combat. Like if you heal someone, sometimes they'll like it. Or if you crit something, they might be like, that was awesome. And then they respond favorably to that. Also, at the end, you can do activities together to boost relationship. Okay. Now... At this point, what do I want to do? This guy is being guarded by the woodsman. Uh, but I can just throw a dagger at this guy. Oh, no, I can't because he's in the first slot. Fine. The woodsman dies. Persistence will overcome even the greatest of okay. Threats. Now, I'm actually going to use... Uh, mm, I can't battlefield medicine just yet. Sadly. But I can... Just put Blight on that guy. Oh, okay. And now Barristan's like really hurt, so he could actually be healed. But... I think we're pretty good here. To just win. Messy, but effective, Messy but effective is right. So we win... And we get some bandages, which we're definitely going to equip. These are better, by the way, than they used to be because they just heal 10%. And we'll take the candle. Now check out our group. I'm going to equip this. After combat, because I shifted myself around, uh, we are back to normal order. So we don't have to switch the order after that combat, we're good. Now watch Barristan's health. You see how we just healed right there? At the same pulse, when the bright light starts to expire, once you've traveled a certain distance, you're passively getting a heal by just kind of recovering in the coach. So watch his health, and it's already up to 31. Dismiss is fully healed, and we get to the inn. So not too shabby. And there's that horrifying mountain peak. That looks like a two. Roman numeral style. The roaring heart does much for the weary body. Even more, perhaps, for the restless soul. So this um, proprietor of the inn here is a fantastic individual. This is COVID precaution, and you really like to see the full mask being worn to not transmit anything to the guests. And... We reach the Torch and Crown, which you can see the name of the inn up here, and we get two candles just for reaching it. So we say continue, and we completed the prologue. You found your fortitude at last, collect what hope you can, and end your expedition here. So we could say continue to end the expedition. And it says right here, the prologue quest is complete. For this venture through the valley, there's nothing left to do, so end the expedition at the lower left of the inn screen. Normally... The expedition can end in three ways. Victory, yay. Defeat, oh my god. Or abandoning, it didn't go well. And Candles of Hope right here, it says, when the journey ends, you're awarded Candles of Hope based on how well you did. Candles are used to unlock and upgrade heroes, items, and more at the Altar of Hope. Even when an expedition is surely lost, it's worth pressing on to get more candles so that we can make the next run better. Also, I'm going to explain, I had this happen recently. I had a hero die in the middle of a run, and I thought, oh, they're going to make me just go with three people. But no, once I reached the inn, there was, we were hired another random person to fill the spot. So as long as you make it to the inn, you get another person to kind of fill the vacancy. So keep going. Now right here, um, all we can do is Sometimes end the expedition. To try anew, fortified by trials past. So what did we get? We are going to get five candles ending early at any point you can end by collecting your candles during normal expeditions making it to the inn is worth the effort because it'll award extra candles by making it to the inn now what they want us to do is quit and there's no option we we can't do anything else so we just have to collect the hope and say yes learn from each attempt deepen your understanding 
and victory will come. So they're saying we're lost in darkness, but that's just what has to happen at the prologue, so don't worry about it. Just, we could fix this stagecoach, no problem. Continue, we got five candles. And it's fixed, look at that. It's fine. It's not a problem. And we're just gonna ride on. And what's this? What have we found? It's the Altar of Hope. Look at all these candles. So you select it. And at the Altar of Hope, you earn these candles and um, you get to spend them however you want. But right now, they're only going to let us visit the working fields. So we'll do that. So we can only go to the working fields, which is this one right here. But there's other options later. Let's select this. Is to make it real once more. Okay, and the working fields. This is where you unlock more trinkets, combat items, in items, and stagecoach upgrades for, for uh, future expeditions. It's vital to continue unlocking items, so spend some candles here whenever you can. Each item unlocked at the altar is also immediately granted into your inventory for the current expedition. So this is cool, like when you unlock something, you're just going to get it next time. So we haven't unlocked any trinkets, combat items, in items, or stagecoach items. So I'm going to unlock one of each, but you can do whatever ratio you'd like. So I'm going to give myself a trinket. Bam. I'm going to give, and we got the fishmonger's gloves. So if a serrated item is equipped, um, we bleed, and uh, there are some bonuses for having serrated stuff, which we'll look at. And then combat items. Let's do one of these. What do we get? New instruments will Great. Help us diagnose the world's affliction and overcome it. So this is like helping you if you're on death's door, and then to overcome death's door if that happens. I'm gonna do a stagecoach item. A drop of sanity All right. In a sea of madness. This is actually really good. So you equip this, and on each location, you have a chance to produce whiskey items, which you can use at the end. Stagecoach items, it says right here. You can equip them at the Wainwright, which is at the inn. Now, whiskey is something that's an inn item that people can use to, like, make better relationships or um, affiliations. And then I'm going to get one inn item here. And we got the Book of Creative Insults. <laughs> another implement at our disposal that's awesome all right great so now we've unlocked this and we just click embark sanctuary as fleeting as a dying star i mean but you know stars take a while to die so let's not get too intense about our astrological metaphors oh and we're back and ill-minded no comfort awaits you here not at all but we completed the prologue and now we're ready to go into denial it's the first step nothing's wrong you have cowered in your crumbling denial long enough come on give me a little more time in my crumbling denial we're gonna ride on steps of the university a collegial handshake that would doom us both your insightful questions during my lectures gave me pause and I recognized in you something of a kindred spirit despite our differences in age and position we shared a keen fascination for archaeology, folklore, and, of course, occultism. The crossroads. Wait for the lantern's light, and welcome what help may come. But who doesn't love occultism? Alright, so now it's time to pick the party again. And, well, guess what? We're going to pick the same party, of course, but look at what we've got. We now have hero goals. So if we get to the tangle, we get two candles. Pride. And if we visit the hoarder two the times, of a hundred campaigns. we get an extra candle. And if we land 
Um, they're actually they're both two candles. If we land a killing blow on two pillagers, uh, she gets two candles, and then if we use the glimmer of hope two times with Paracelsus, we get two candles. So that's wonderful. So now we have a way to earn a bunch more candles, which will make our account stronger and stronger as we go. And we're going to click this. So what are you seeing? You are seeing the loop of the game. Now they've been gating us, of course, because we had to do the prologue. But now this Onward, is it. Once again, though all the world's horrors bar the way. Oh, pish posh. I'm going to push I. Look, we've got all these items to equip. And now I can't uh, throw this on the stagecoach right now because the Wainwright has to put this on at the end. Uh, but I do have this in item, this combat item, which is eh. Now, serrated, let me see what uh, Paracelsus, this is serrated, right? You know what? I mean, it's a serrated blade, but I don't believe it, it counts yet as being serrated, but I'll try it just to see if it works, and then we'll put this right here. And this is the game loop. You're going to go, and you're going to fight. You're either going to die, or maybe you're going to win that run. You're going to use candles to make yourself stronger so you could keep making it further in the game and potentially reach the ending. We're going to unlock more characters. Uh, if I push the map, you're going to see we've got all sorts of new things to encounter again here in the valley. And then we're going to get to make some more choices about where we go. We're going to try to fulfill these hero awards to get more candles. We're going to try to visit the Shrines of Recollection to strengthen our heroes by unlocking more skills. And we're going to learn about more features of the game that we haven't yet seen. But we're going to have to get into that next time because I really think this is a good place to end the first episode. I don't want to, this first episode of the guide to be like 50 hours long. It's a long guide to be sure, but there's so much to talk about. This is a complicated game, but I'm telling you, it's worth it once you get into it. I have a ton of fun with this. It feels really satisfying when you can make progress and get your more heroes in your party, get to make more choices, get more trinkets and things unlocked so you, you build really uh, comfortable loadouts that you feel good about and you chip away at this game. I hope you found this to be helpful uh, if you're just starting out or you're thinking about playing Darkest Dungeon 2. If you have any questions, post those in the comments below and let me know. Do you want to see me take this series further? Do you want me to explain more of the game as we go through, show you more content, walk you through um, bosses, more decisions, things like that? Please let me know that in the comments below as well. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Take care.